So folks, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. We're actually coming to our final keynote. Uh, and I'm so grateful that all of you have uh, stuck around for the last hour and 40 minutes. Uh, but we're going to make this worth your while and you're in for a real treat. Uh, uh, Dr. Dipesh Nafsaria uh, is a leading expert at the intersection of health and early learning. Uh, Dr. Nafsaria is the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He's the founding med medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin and the vice chair of the board for Reach Out and Read nationally. He is also on the executive committee for the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Early Childhood. Dr. Nafsari's keynote, A Healthy Child is Ready to Learn, to Learn, will discuss how we can improve literacy in communities through preventative health programs like Reach Out and Read, uh, an important topic given the conversation we heard during our legislator panel. You'll hear more about Reach Out and Read from Dr. Nafsari, but, but understand this, and I hope Lisa Blair is still on the webinar because What's happening with Reach Out and Read in Florida is nothing short of remarkable. Uh, the program currently in our state reaches 220,000 children each year uh, at 219 pediatric offices across 35 counties. Uh, and the program gets books into the, the hands of young children through their doctor office visits. So uh, unfortunately, just because of time, Dr. Nafsari will not be able to answer any questions today. But if you do have questions, uh, put them in the chat box uh, or send them on social media. And we will make sure to post the responses on social media later this week. So with that, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Nafsari. Good morning. Thank you very much, Vance. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me join you today um, from uh, up north in Wisconsin. Uh, it's really a, a delight. I'll also answer the question that many people have when they um, see all the, uh, uh, hear about my background and see all the degrees after my name and all. Uh, yes, I have a lot of uh, student loan debt. So we'll just get rolling with that. I'm going to make sure my slides are up here. Um, so uh, I have a very short period of time with you to share a lot of information, some of which you've heard already today. So there's a lot of intersections, a lot of different ways of looking at this, and a lot of different um, uh, uh, ways of explaining kind of a lot of this information. Um, so my goal is to move quickly, but to try to help, you know, kind of tie all this together in a number of different ways. So with that, let's get started here. So when I tell people that one of the things that I get to do in my practice as a pediatrician is to talk to families about reading together, I often hear something like this. Oh, that's so nice. And you know what? It is a great thing. It is a nice thing that I'm able to do that. But I want to help people realize that when we talk to families about sharing books with their young child and singing and playing and doing all these things, that we're actually doing something that's absolutely critical and not just simply doing something that's nice or cute or something like that. And I think that's the message that is slowly getting out there into the community as we can see from the sheer amount of interest in this um, just on this morning's uh, event alone. So let's talk a little bit about the early brain. And certainly a lot of this is done work that's built on um, others like Dr. Shankoff, who you heard from earlier. And he was actually on the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. They um, released a report um, over a decade ago now called the Science of Early Childhood Development. But one of the things that they did was try to articulate what the research tells us in some key points that really help us drive forward policy um, and programs and how we think about things. So I wanna walk quickly through those. Talking about child development as a foundation for community and economic development, right? We don't, we don't often think about children in that way, but we need to recognize that infrastructure of the early brain is as much infrastructure as highways and bridges and tunnels and things like that. Um, people are part of our society and children become adult people who, who form uh, the backbone of that society in many ways. Number two, brains are built over time. You've heard this multiple times today that you can't just do a whole bunch of things early and then say, great, we're done. But at the same time, we also need to recognize that if things didn't go ideally early on, there's always a chance for recovery. It's harder, it takes more resources, but there's always a chance to be able to do all of, all of those sorts of things. There's sort of a three-legged stool about thinking about development and health trajectories that, that children can have. Um, there's the biological and medical factors that um, matter. This is why we look at them. But then we realized that it wasn't just those factors, that it was the socioeconomic environment children are in, that the zip code that a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code has been apparent to us for a long time and is well supported by data. But then we also realized that there was something else, that it was the microenvironment around children. 
Who's at home? Who's in their neighborhood? Who's in their early childhood center? And how are those folks interacting? And that became the third kind of leg of the stool here. And that brings me to the third point, that if you had to say, how do we shape this brain that's developing? How do we get those neurons to wire to each other in ways that are productive for life and all? Well, you need your genes, you have the blueprints, but you also need experiences to help guide which neurons wire to which ones. And this is really important. And you can't have one without the other. It's like a campfire. You need to have wood and a spark in order to get that flame going. So um, you can't modify genes so much. No time to talk about epigenetics today. But we can talk about experiences. And that's through the policies that we set up, the programs that we enact, and through the advice that we give and creating the conditions that are right. And then if you ask me, what's the most important thing that matters? It's what we call children's engagement in these serve and return, like in tennis, this back and forth interaction with loving caregivers around them, whether that's their parents or other adults or relatives, whoever that may be. That back and forth interaction is what drives development. And this is the most important thing that I, I, I can say today in my time, is that that back and forth interaction with other human beings that care and love, love them is what drives development. There's no app. There's no DVD series. There's nothing in a child under age three that on its own is going to drive development. It needs people. As one of my colleagues has said, there is no app to replace your lap. There's a video I often play and won't for time today, and you will have these slides later, but if you go on YouTube and just type in the face-to-face -face paradigm, you can watch what happens when these back and forth interactions happen well, when there's a breakdown in those interactions, and then the recovery that can happen. And I encourage you to watch that if you haven't already. I suspect many of you probably have. Now, the other thing is, is that I wanna give you an example of how our choices matter. Um, a librarian that we have that uh, comes to our children's hospital and reads a lot in the waiting room told me one day about a little girl with a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, basically, she's a most severe form. She can only really move facial expressions um, and uh, not really the rest of her. Many doctors visits, many hospitalizations, et cetera. She read aloud to this young, young child in the waiting room. Um, her dad was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And her face lit up, she cooed, she smiled, she laughed. And when the librarian was done, she looked up at dad and he was just dumbfounded because so much was quote unquote, not right with this child. He never realized that her brain was actually essentially normal, was born normal, and that this interaction could happen and that it was possible to have a good productive interaction like this. And that again points out that if we treat children who are differently abled um, as not being able to interact, not being able to engage with others, their brains won't get that stimulation and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if we realize that we can do that, then our choices do matter and do make a difference. Number four, we need basic skills and circuits to do more complex things. Pretty straightforward. As many, including T. Barry Browson, have said, play is the work of infancy. This next point, which many of you may be familiar with, is about this idea of toxic stress that causes persistent effects on the neuroendocrine system and causes lifelong problems. We can see this on brain CT scans of children who have not had social interaction. This is extreme emotional neglect, not physical neglect that you're seeing there in that head CT on the right there that makes that brain look so small and shrunken and not, not as dense with neurons. We know that we have a built-in stress response. This is great when we're walking in the woods and we're surprised by a hungry bear, but it's not so great when it becomes a way of life. We pump out these stress hormones. We have a neurological response. Now, small amounts of stress are fine. We call them positive stress. That's actually how we learn and how we um, advance and move forward in many ways. Tolerable stressors are more serious, but if we have good supportive relationships, it buffers it. Ah, see, there's that relationships piece again. And then we have toxic stress, which is when you might have the same levels of stress as intolerable, but they're prolonged, they're not temporary, and there's few or no protective relationships. So in a ch young child's life, if they don't have those supportive relationships, situations like child abuse or parental substance abuse or homelessness, that leads to what we call toxic stress because it leads to this toxic cycle of what happens. These stressors occur. This fight or flight response, this bear response becomes chronic. You're pumping out these stress hormones all the time. 
it causes some brain changes. But here's what we see, here's what I see in clinics, here's what we see in schools, in early childhood centers, in homes, is this hyper-responsive stress response. Kids aren't as calm, they can't cope as well because they're always seeking, looking for danger, looking out for it to keep themselves safe. And that in turn feeds into more stress. And that's what leads to some of these puzzling and extraordinarily challenging behaviors that many struggle to be able to cope with and to understand, including, let's add, the children and the families themselves, of course. So the result, we've heard multiple times today, people talking about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And again, for many, it's a study they've never heard of. I suspect most of you have heard of it. And again, this is um, a study of adults co connecting what happened to them as children and linking it forward to, the, to what happened across their adult lives. Please do remember that this was a study of the middle class um, and not necessarily just of our stereotypical marginalized communities, that this really was a study of the general population. They looked at these different categories of abuse, neglect, and, ho and household dysfunction and saw that these were extraordinarily common, that there was so many of these going, going on in different ways. Even the smallest number was not all that much and didn't really add up to, 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 to more, to more than, than, than that. Now you can't really measure adversity in a clear cut way. Um, so your, um, but you can do an ACE score. You can do one point for each category that, that someone said, yes, this happened to me. And that's how they measure kind of the impact of adversity. And many had none, but a quarter had at least one and four, five or six, one in 20. So very common, but then they also found a cumulative effect. And I'll give you two real quick examples here. One is the risk of developmental delay. Look what happens when you have five, six or seven adverse childhood experience categories of yes, your risk of developmental delay goes up to 75, nearly 100% in that grouping compared to a much lower number for those who just, just had one or two. The next slide is the one that blew my mind as a doctor seven or eight adverse childhood experiences tripled your odds of adult heart disease. Tripling, right? This is decades later. So we're building into the biology of young children changes that are playing out in measures of physical health even. And I could show you another 50 slides though, of associations. But the last point from that report was that if we get it right early on, it's more effective and less costly than trying to figure it out later. Now, I also wanna say, I can't give this sort of talk and not refer to what's going on in our world right now. Um, families are facing immense challenges and that, that is abundantly clear to us. This is an ancient screenshot. These numbers are so out of date, so please don't squint at them too much, but you can see how many people have been marked as like, you know, they've been uh, infected um, with uh, the COVID-19 virus. But I also wanna point out there's a lot of families in the United States, 83 million uh, families, and the economic, emotional, social, et cetera, impacts of the pandemic alone are even more than those who are infected. This is not to downplay infection. This is simply to say that this reverberates beyond just simply the number of people who've been actually infected. And struggles have always been present, right? This, is, this has actually been, been true, but now we're seeing them even more clearly um, across a wider swathe of society and recognizing that them as being there. And of course, I would be amiss if I didn't point out that what we've, the, the reckoning that our country has been having around racism has been clear. And if you haven't read the American Academy of Pediatrics statement on the impact of racism on child and adolescent health, which is from 2019, so actually um, before this year, uh, you should. It is an easy read. It is not super long, but it is profound and important at getting at some of these root causes. So if you can permit me to share a little, a quote with you and then a little bit of, of artwork. Um, I think of the writer Anatoly Broyard who talks about dealing with illness and struggle as he would want those helping him to be like Virgil, the Roman poet leading Dante through the, the inferno, through uh, the, the levels of hell and the divine comedy. And uh, this, this helped me realize how what all of us do in our various helping professions. Um, and I have a couple of Renaissance images. You can see here um, Virgil and Dante in the lower right corner um, looking into parts of hell and, and, and exploring it. And you can see how Virgil is helping him understand what's, what he's seeing in front of him. In this one by Delacroix, you can see um, Dante in the red there on the left. He's sort of losing his balance and his, the look on his face. He's, 
He's just can't believe what's happening. And I think we've all felt this way, right? At some point this year that what is going on around us? But you notice how Virgil's there right next to him and he's holding him up. He's giving him some support. And that's a lot of what we do for families and people around us um, that we serve. Okay, so what can we do about it? I will give you the solution. Well, not really. I'm gonna give you principles of solutions. We need solutions that do a few things. We need to build capabilities, right? How can we help parents learn how to read effectively and well with their, with their young children? Great. How can we build capacities? Parent might say, I know how to read to my child. I love reading to my child. I don't get paid a living wage and I'm not home in the nights, in the evenings to do this because I had to work a second job. Okay, how do we build that capacity? Do things based in homes and communities, address root causes, use go for long-term effects, use a prevention mindset, leverage those key first thousand days of life, use evidence to guide us, not necessarily constrain us, but to guide us and do things that we can take to scale as well because we can do lots of really small intensive things but there's a lot of need out there. We need to take things to scale. Um, one example that's out there is Reach Out and Read, a program I've been associated with for a long time. It's been around for 30 years. We use the regular checkups that ch young children go to, those, those the shots, the weights, you know, developmental screenings, all that. We use those checkups in, in clinical medical offices to take the opportunity to talk to families about sharing books together with their young children. If I had to summarize in, in a single image, it would be this here, what I call the prescription to read. Um, I actually do hand these out in clinic. And the point is to talk about it, but to also skill build, to reinforce, and to really make sure that families feel comfortable, confident, and capable in doing this every day. Because if we just hand them a book or drop a book on them from the sky, well, many families will do well, but some may not know if they're doing it right. So they need the coaching piece. And why not do it in a place that they're already going from someone that they're already generally listening to and asking advice of. And reach out and read people say, it's like the blind men and the elephant, right? They, they all see different things. They say, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, you're, you're giving away books in the clinic. Yeah, we're doing that, but we're also at doing an educational intervention. We've heard a lot about education today. We're doing developmental surveillance. We're helping build parental capacities. We're helping buffer toxic stress. We're assessing the health of relationships. We're using a public health approach and we're using a scalable, yes, evidence-based model that's out there. So when it comes down to it, it's not any one or two of these things. Ultimately, programs like Reach Out and Read that do strong, meaningful parental support, coaching, modeling, and guiding are all of these things. And if you wanna read more about that, go to Google, type in the elephant in the clinic. You can download a free report that I and a colleague wrote about all those elements. And if you're not sick of hearing me um, this morning, uh, we also, as of this year, have a new podcast from Reach Out and Read. Go to reachoutandread.org slash podcast. And uh, you can hear over, uh, I think we're up to 10 episodes uh, so, uh, so far this year. Uh, lots of fun, lots of great things about childhood, uh, children's books and reading together. So we're not just merely an advice or book giveaway. Um, what we are is a process of parental skill building and support. We're secretly a parenting support program and we're using already existing skilled, trusted professionals to make this go. All right, so let's go back to thinking about now and the solution for now. Families clearly need support. We, we, we know that and it's what we're all working on in different ways. So how can we support the health of relationships and making sure that, that those relationships are going well? Shared reading is of course a great scaffold for that as well as other forms of interaction that we can, we can help families do and do well. So coming back for just a couple more pieces of Renaissance art, because there's a lot we can learn from this pandemic about togetherness, about connection and about how we help one another. And there's opportunities like Virgil and Dante here meeting the great poets of history uh, in, this, in this image. And then this image where they're in the ninth circle of hell, this one stood out to me because you can see again, there's Dante in the red, Virgil in the bluish green there. They're in the, the worst part of hell. They're looking around at, at everything that has happened. But you notice a difference in this one. This time, Dante has his arm around Virgil. He is the one comforting his guide. And this is something that has occurred to me so many times in this tough, difficult year, is that while we provide strength and support to those we serve, we also derive strength and support by serving them and by listening to them and witnessing what they do and what they manage. 
And I, I personally find that deeply affirming and I hope you do as well and look for that whenever, whenever possible. So to wrap this up in the last couple of moments here, I like to think about a public health approach to building healthy brains. When kids fall, we're gonna need a net to catch them and their families. That first net, it has big holes, but it's a big net, that's our prevention net. It's gonna catch most of them, yay. Then you have a smaller net that you need for those who fall through, that's your screening and your targeted interventions. Smaller holes, but a smaller net. And then for those that still make it through, we got our treatment net. We can't have everyone at the top fall through to that bottom net. It'll be overwhelmed. All levels of this are necessary. None on their own are sufficient, okay? So I like to think about it in this stepwise process and think about where you and the work you do fit. We know that public investment makes a great difference. The brain's capacity to change is early on, but most of our spending is still aimed at the, the later end of the, of the spectrum there. But we can do this here in Wisconsin several years ago. We did a joint resolution that went unanimously through our Senate and Assembly that the, the, I won't read the whole thing here, the resolve talked about early brain development, toxic stress, adversity, relationships, um, you know, and, and human capital and so on and, and so forth. Um, it was the start of several conversations and moves that we made in our legislature, which is why I put the success kit up there with hashtag winning. I want to close with a couple more things here. One quote, while schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever-increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. And I also exhort us all to think about it this way. Let's not return to normal. Let's build a better normal for our children, for our families, and for us as a society. And I always close with this image. This is my wife years ago reading to my son, who's now a college freshman. Uh, I caught them in this beautiful moment of being lost in a book together. And this really reminds me of how children are made readers in the laps of their parents and how parents are their child's first and best teachers. And if everything we do is aimed at making that a reality and making sure parents feel comfortable, capable, and indeed see themselves that way, then we're really gonna have a bright future um, all together. Finally, one more reminder, my public facing social media, Facebook and Twitter, and my email address. If you have other questions, feel free to reach out in that way. But of course, um, I know that the staff here are collecting things that have been in the Q&A and chat, and uh, we will try our best to get some responses to you um, at, a, at a later point. My time with you has been all too brief, but thank you again for this opportunity. It's really exciting to hear what you have going on in the Sunshine State. Thank you.